Thanks. Microphone is working, right? You can hear me well, right? Cool. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Really excited um, to be here at AgentConf. Actually, I missed AgentConf uh, uh, last year, and I was like so excited to to get here this year. So before CFPs, before every, everything, I'll just like send tons of emails, like when there will be CFP, so I can go to the conf and enjoy um, enjoy it. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited uh, to be here today to talk about AR, about GraphQL, about data-driven AR. And yeah, um, let's start. So a little bit about myself. So uh, my name is Vladimir Novik. This is my fancy logo over there, which is basically just a copy paste from VS Code. So <laughs> and um, currently, I'm developer advocate at uh, Hasura.io. I'm also GDE author consultant uh, in web, mobile, VR, AR, and IoT fields. Probably I should add AI blockchain to be on top of buzzwords, but I'm st still not there yet. Um, so yeah, if you have like any questions about like any of these technologies, you can reach me on Twitter, um, on my website. I have a YouTube channel. I recently started streaming a lot on Twitch. So yeah. So today we will talk about Reality 2.0 version. Well. Um, it's actually called augmented reality. The reason why I call it reality 2.0 because um, augmented reality comes to augment our existing world with data that um, supposed to help us in a way. Um, we we don't see like lots of apps that really help us to do uh, something. Mostly it's like a gimmicky apps on on uh, App Store and mostly like game uh, type of apps. But in uh, recent years it evolved to other um, uh, other domains to uh, like uh, financial, uh, like the fintech, to retail, to uh, uh, even like to medicine. People use AR and medicine for um, uh, like surgeons use uh, Microsoft HoloLens, for example, for uh, operations. And um, some factories use um, AR for producing or for Q uh, QA process. So. Um, how AR started in the first place. It started a while ago. It started probably from more towards VR uh, world, and then it kind of evolved into AR. So uh, this is like the picture from 60s, 60s. I think it's 68. And the device the guy has over the head is called uh, Salt of Democles. The reason it's called like that because the salt of the Mongols is a mythos about the salt of uh, faith that is hanging uh, above each person. That when the salt falls, the person dies. This thing weighs two ton. So yeah, it's probably the reason why it was called like that. Um, and then there was like a bunch of machines where you stick your uh, head inside and uh, you see a bunch of pixels. Um, there will be uh, there was involvement in 80s to virtual pictures or like um, the guy here has a helmet with two cameras and basically he sees uh, cameras from robot perspective oper operating on uh, some product and uh, the Google Glass started in the picture on the left it was called iTap then it's evolved to the Google Glass. Um, and in recent years, we have Microsoft HoloLens, which is marketed amazing. Like you see all of these pictures, guys standing, lots of AR content in, in the world. Actually, it looks like this. So uh, we're not quite there yet, but we are getting towards that. And um, especially when we're using our phones, because with the creation of AR kit and AR core, um, most of you have like uh, have phone that can use AR app that can analyze the, the current environment and can basically um, overlay content on the environment. So previously, this content was just overlaid as an image, but right now, processing power in our devices is enough to understand the positioning in the environment, to process the, the difference in, in contrast and to understand where we want to position three, a 3D object in the environment. So um, Pokemon Go on the left will like really uh, uh, good catch of <laughs> Pokemon, and on the right you probably see these uh, types of uh, guns in stores. And at some point it will get uh, to be like uh, eyeglasses, and uh, and really like most of us will probably wear that. At least that's where the industry goes, right? So 
uh, yeah, at some point, we got to the picture over there. And it sounds perfectly normal right now, but like 20 years ago, it was uh, like, don't sit in front of TV, right? Um, so AR can be really beneficial. Not in that way, right? Uh, but like this is like uh, hilarious, uh, like satire on on what can actually AR give us. But uh, for example, we here um, we have mounties, we have ski resort here, right? So there are uh, there is AR goggles for skiing where you can ski down the slope and collect coins. So it's a nice thing unless you fall from the slope and yeah. So uh, we, we need to be aware of our uh, environment. So we're still trying to get into AR. Um, yeah, so the question is how we, as a developers, start creating this content today. So we, we've seen today a talk about how to create uh, uh, AR with uh, one existing framework. I will talk about a bunch, but I will focus on more on like React Native side and how we create uh, AR apps with React Native. So when you think about AR and like games and like heavily, uh, uh, heavy like graphic content, you think about Unity on real game engines. And it's true, you can create AR content with them. And it's perfectly fine, it, it works, and it's, uh, it's amazing. There is a before engine which gives you this concept of markers that you can scan, you can put 3D content on top of it, and you can manipulate the 3D content in the real world. Um, but I'm uh, going to talk today about Vero Framework, which has actually two implementations. It has a Java implementation, uh, and it's called Vero Core. But I will talk today about React Native implementation, which is called Vero React. And we'll actually see a bunch of things done with this, uh, with this framework, and we'll, we will talk about how you, we consume the data. So the features of Vero, basically it kind of consolidates AR kit and AR core and VR inside like one environment. It gives you real world tracking, plane surface detection, image, marker recognition, powerful render, and real world effects. Lots of fancy words, what does it actually mean? Uh, let's actually see it in action, because that will be probably the best way to explain. Whoa, what happened with the... I think I just need to open my phone then. Okay, too small. Sorry for technical problems here. I don't see your phone. Okay, it's small. Let's make it bigger. I hope I won't get notifications right now. This can be embarrassing. <laughs> so, yeah, so I have AR and VR selectors here, so let's select AR. And I will see it's snowy. <laughs> and this is the particles effect I'm talking about. Right, so what I can also do, I can scan my surface. Surfaces here, and whoa. And can put 3D models in the world. You see the shadow on the floor, so I can actually work around this guy and it seems to be real, but yeah, obviously it's not. I can walk through it. Oh, yeah, it was, it, it had a little bit. But yeah, uh, that's maybe in the future, haptic feedback and stuff like that. But that's the, like, that's the idea, right? So you can do this stuff with Vero React. And the question is how we do it. So how do I basically create these type of awesome apps? And probably you want me to, to show you the code, right? Like, how do I do this stuff? So let's get started with Vero. So with Vero, you can get started for free. There's no like pricing model, at least for, for now. I don't know like, how it will be in the future. But basically, you need to get sort of an API key from veromedia.com, and you install your uh, CLI tool, React Vero CLI, uh, and init your app. So um, I hope it will load. OK, cool. So how it looks like, we have a regular React Native up here. We have touchable highlight with a bunch of styles. But the important part here is get AR, get experience button press. And uh, what happens under the hood, we have get AR navigator. So we have these components, Vero AR C navigator, 
which has initial scene. And you basically pass AR scene to this navigator to be able to uh, see the camera and render, uh, render all the 3D content inside 3D world. So, um, yeah, so that's how like the actual, uh, the actual um, AR scene that you've seen, how it looks like. The wrapping component uh, has to be Vero AR scene and has a tracking function on tracking updated where you can listen if tracking is lost, if lights condition are not good, you will have uh, like uh, constant, uh, your constant updates on your tracking state if, the, if for example, tracking is lost or stuff like that. So um, it's not enough just to wrap everything with Vero AR scene, you need to define lights. And here we go into like 3D uh, programming uh, concepts, right? We will have lights, we will have 3D models, we'll have textures, materials, and stuff like that. So we need to set up lights. So we have a bunch of them. We have ambient lights, we have directional lights, and we have spotlights, uh, stuff like that. So ambient light, just like uh, consider this as a color filling the whole, uh, the whole basically. Directional light, it's like a sun. It comes from one direction. Uh, to uh, like with the vector and you basically s can specify what will be the shadow, how the shadow will look like, on which way it will be reflected on the surface. And spotlights is pretty much self-descriptive, it just putting a spotlight on your object. Then I had these like change particle effects, button text uh, flowing around. So uh, this is Vero text and you have here width and height and positioning and rotation and stuff like that. So width and height, uh, as well as positioning, is in meters. So it's like meters in the real world. So here I can say that this is like two meters width, two meter height, and positioned in like uh, minus two on X. It's like over there, uh, up, and in front of me. So uh, Z axis, minus, uh, when it's uh, minus, it's always in front of me. And uh, we had these like rectangle, gray rectangle, right? When I scanned the surface, I had rect uh, um, um, gray rectangle in front of me. So it's a helper component called VR Airplane Selector, and it basically gave me the ability to render my uh, monster inside uh, on this specific spot. So basically, ARKit recognizes that there is a surface here, and it gives me an anchor. I can put anything on this uh, anchor, touch to this anchor. So, uh, and here you see anchor ID is basically the ID that I put to uh, the, uh, the wrapping plate for the uh, wrapping plane for the monster to uh, put him on the specific spot. Um, Vero node is stands for as a view in React. It's basically a wrapping container that you can move around, and this is the whole monster thing. So there is a, like bunch of props here. The important ones is source and resources. So Vero supports several types of objects, supports FBX, uh, OBJ, GLTF. So v FBX is, uh, like these are like standard formats for 3D models. Vero has its own CLI tool that converts FBX to VRX, which is their specific binary model. And then uh, you require a bunch of uh, textures to be able to render your monster. And uh, we have animations, so we can do a skeletal animation. As you've seen, monster kind of moves on the spot. So these are the animation that you specify. And we had a quad for the shadow. So uh, that's about it uh, um, for the, this specific monster. We had uh, also materials, uh, but we'll see them more in detail um, in the next demo. So we've seen the monster, it's cool, it's gimmicky, it's not really for production. It's, you've seen resources as something that is bundled with your app. You cannot scale it, right? You cannot put apps with huge amount of, uh, amount of like FBX models and cannot do like something like really uh, production ready with it. It's good for playing around, but how we actually bring the data to our app, and we will do it today. So. Uh, the answer is we bring you the GraphQL and just um, recap on GraphQL, query language for API, that feels like magic. Um, we had a talk about GraphQL uh, yesterday and um, just to recap in a nutshell, uh, when we define our queries, mutations, subscriptions, 
the data that we get back is in the same format. And this is the simple format. This is more complex format. Uh, but it gives uh, us this kind of magic feeling and uh, like everything is working, everything is with one endpoint and everything is awesome. So uh, we will build today GraphQL backend with Hasura platform. So the question is what uh, is Hasura? Um, so Hasura is open source and it's totally free. It's an engine that gives you auto-generate a GraphQL API on top of your, uh, your database. Mostly Postgres, but you can migrate from Firebase, you can migrate from uh, NoSQL database, you can use Postgres extensions and stuff like that. And uh, basically it runs in Docker, so it can be deployed anywhere, compatible with every auth solutions. Uh, I told you about databases already. And uh, it uh, has like awesome like CLI tools, uh, has a bunch of additional stuff. In addition to that, you're not limited to the engine, so you can connect your own GraphQL backend, you can use, let's say, Hasura, you want to use DynamoDB with AppSync, you totally can do, uh, do it. You, can use, you want to use um, um, uh, GraphQL Yoga for your, your own custom um, uh, GraphQL server, you can also do it. And you can basically stitch all these schemas together into one uh, endpoint. And in addition to that, it has a, its own eventing system, meaning when you change something in database, event can trigger serverless function that will, for example, do your business logic and return mutation back to the engine. Then the engine knows to uh, run this mutation and uh, enter data into uh, database. So it's like async serverless concept. Um, so let's basically create our backend, how we actually start. Um, as a simple use case, obviously it's like not a produ for production uh, use case, but just for playing around, you can just go to a website, click on the get started with Heroku button, click on deploy, enter your app name, and after like two minutes or something, you will get something like this. Let me load it. So this is the console. So this is the Hasura console. So in Hasura console, you have four tabs. You have graf uh, graphical data, remote schemas, and events. We won't touch today remote schemas and events. I did that on, uh, on my YouTube channel. If you want to like, dig more into the, this, you are welcome to watch that. But today, we will use uh, these two tabs. So data is basically my view on the database, how, it's, uh, how tables are created, how relations uh, are connected between, connecting between um, uh, fields and uh, stuff like that. So for example, I have markers here with a bunch of data, I have model resources, models, portals. So a bunch of real data we haven't covered like what this data actually means, right? And like, what do I do with this data? So uh, this is the overview for your offline reading. So what is this about? And let's see it in action. What is this actually about? <coughs> So I have, I have also like sort of like logging in and logging out. So I have a list of markers. So I told you about like uh, having markers in the real world that I can scan and, and bring uh, content on top of these markers, right? So I have like my business cards that I can scan and I have a business card with this uh, tiny icon, like 3D icon, or I have regular ones. So if I scan regular business card, and again, it brings my view, so right now I have my business card. Yeah, the lightning is not good, so let's just put it like that. And yeah, so uh, so it's here. Now I will try to do some fancy stuff. Ah, uh, no, I can't. Okay, let's. I need another hand. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Can you hold it and point on the? Yeah. So right now, you see I have, here goes website thing. So I can go to my console, and I can go to my mar markers data. So I'm using user, which is, I think, on the second page. I think it's this one. Let's edit this user. It's not this one. No, it's actually on markers. So forget, forgot where my data is. Uh, 
Okay, so I have here, here goes website link, right? Like this, okay. okay. Let's let's do it like that. So instead of, so this is directly to the database, right? And it's reflected automatically in the real world. So that's how subscriptions work. And uh, as you can see, they work in the like in the real world, right? So thanks. <laughs> it's not all I have other demos. So <laughs> um, okay, now what I can do. I can obviously have like, uh, for example, this sticker that I can scan and have additional data. And let's actually create a new one. Let's uh, set marker URL. Where is the page? Wait a second. Yeah, live demos. I think I need to copy the logo. So let's say I copy this logo. And then, supposed to give me paste, okay, fine. Uh, now avatar URL, I put the same username of all Tasura, last name, GraphQL, Twitter, Tasura HQ. Ah, yeah, I also have additional data. Let's just put it test. So I add this. This is the data that is sent in mutation to my uh, engine. So if I go back, I will have this uh, marker that I, I can click on, and I can get the data, right? So this is also like how subscriptions work and uh, refresh queries and stuff like that. But, but it's not all. I also have a 3D thing, which takes a little bit time to load because uh, the model that I found has like really huge textures. So um, obviously when you do something like for production, you will take uh, like more optimized models. You probably will have like 3D artists that can optimize your 3D models for real time. But the, the thing is, uh, this model is loading right now in the background and now I have the callback firing the models loaded. Uh, now what I can do, I can scan this marker and I have a car on this marker, right? So I also can load 3D models on, on the marker, not only uh, in the like, uh, scanning the surface. So it gives me uh, really um, great ability to, for example, do something for retail. When you go to a store, you have markers in the store, and you scan them, you get additional data. And recently, ARKit released 3D object scanning. So the idea is you scan the, the actual object, and it gives you key points on the object that you can, uh, it can recognize later on. And you basically can take a jar of peanut butter, you can put your phone on top of this jar and you will get like the nutrition value and stuff like that. So this is one of the demos. The other one that I want to show you, and I will need also help here, and I guess quite a bit. So th there is a concept, wait, wait a second. So there is a concept of portals. So there is a window here to the eternal blackness. But no, that actually it's sort of like, like a portal that I can enter. And if I look out of this portal, I will actually see the real world. <laughs> so right now, I need you to come here and just, uh, no, come here, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Just hold the phone. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. So what we will do now, we will see how our, our subscriptions are working for the portals. And we will teleport you to Hawaii. So let's go to our portal and let's edit the field and let's save it. Obviously, it, now it starts to load in this image. But if you turn around and we'll see, uh, we'll look at the, uh, yeah, at the grid that you have. Now you're in Hawaii. Uh, the portal has closed. You are stuck. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You can, <laughs> you, you can exit. <laughs> so these are how portals work. So um, imagine 
real estate, when you have uh, an app with a bunch of portals and you let the customers to walk into the actual apartments to like look at the uh, live view of, the, of uh, these apartments. So this is, uh, this is like, uh, yeah. Uh, this is really cool, but yeah, I had a spoiler. You need to see the code, right? How do I do that? How I connect all these, how subscriptions are working, how, how it's done. So let's walk through the code and we'll see uh, how it actually looks like. So I start a simple React app with a GraphQL um, and, well, not quite simple, as React app with GraphQL and subscriptions. Uh, so right now there is like nothing uh, going on with AR. I just import GraphQL, import subscriptions for, uh, from React Apollo, JQL from GraphQL tag. And what I do uh, is define my, so I had a screen with the markers, right? I define uh, my markers uh, subscription. And I have a bunch of uh, things going on here. I have markers, ID, if it's uh, 3D, image URL, a bunch of data that I need for this uh, marker to pass down the props to the actual AR screen, right? Um, and then I do regular React Native stuff. I have safe area view, and I have subscription component. So subscription component is the component that comes with React Apollo, and basically it gives you a render prop with loading error and data uh, functions that you can uh, like listen to if you are loading in loading state, then return this, if you have data, return that. Uh, so now we basically have a flat list with our marker image in re regular React Native app. So our um, navigation in the app is the same as regular React Native app, React Navigation, Tab Navigator, Stack Navigator. Um, nothing uh, uh, going on with the AR here, right? So I render my marker item, but notice this prop. So I have navigate to AR function is the custom prop that I created for marker item. And basically it uh, calls this function. Uh, I think I have missing, uh, yeah. So it basically goes to this, uh, this screen to AR scene. AR scene is a wrapping scene for uh, all of my AR scene is in the app. Because when you had this camera view, you also had like a bottom uh, button with go back stuff and, and stuff like that. So you don't create this in Vero, you just create it with regular React Native and you just put your AR view inside your React Native view and that's it, it just works. But, but not, not, not only uh, you put it inside, you also need to define this like Vero AR navigator, right? So this is what is happening here in this function, in get AR view. So, so you have the, scene, the same scene navigator you've seen previously, and uh, you uh, basically pass uh, several props to it. You pass, uh, if I check if it's a portal, then I pass portal scene. If it's not, I pass a marker scene. So let's look at the marker. Marker scene starts the same as my uh, monster scene. So nothing new here, the same thing that we've seen with the monster, which was statically rendered. We have the AR scene, we have the directional light, and we render our AR content. And again, the same Vero node. But here's where, where things are different. We have subscriptions inside where we watch for changes for this specific marker. So when we watch for changes, we are able to see uh, when this um, like bottom bar link was changed in the Hasura console in the database, it was reflected automatically because it's wrapped in the subscription and it's wrapped in this render prop. So this was the subscription running, and that's, yeah, so this is the subscription, basically it uh, uh, was wrapped with this component. So later on, for doing markers, whether it's image, whether it's object, you need to use Vero AR image marker, a specific component that takes the uh, target that you define later on, and we have on anchor found. The reason we have that, because we want to do animations at some point, right? We want to animate our view uh, going out from the car to the right or our um, 3D model of the car popping into the view. So we want to run that whenever uh, our engine knows that this is, uh, the anchor is found. I know this is a surface, I know this is a marker, I, I have the idea and a specific position 
of this item in the real world. Then we set our state to running animation. Uh, um, I got an excuse why I used set state instead of I used hooks because subscription was not there yet in uh, React Apollo hooks, but they launched an uh, hour ago, so I probably, yeah, so I probably need to rewrite this with hooks, but yeah, for, for now it's with the uh, set state and classes. Um, so to do our animations, we need to register them. We, uh, the same as you define like, your style sheet, create the same you do like with uh, defining your animations and defining your materials. You call, uh, you're calling register animations function and pass a uh, bunch of uh, objects with uh, properties that you want to animate. So I'm animating position X and opacity with specific easing function and uh, yes, it supports lots of easing function that are you used to. Um, specified duration, and then you can do this animation. In addition to that, obviously, if there is a 3D model, you can do like skeletal animations when you specify a name, as you've seen in uh, 3D model example. So uh, let's see. Yeah. So this is how we run it. We basically define that animation name will be image, and uh, our state will be, uh, the run. Uh, property will be uh, as our run animation. So whenever our set uh, state update is triggered, animation is starting to run. Uh, for the like the the content and layouting thing, so previously you've seen in the example I used Vero text for uh, putting this like change particles button, but in the real world when you have lots of UIs, I want some kind of um, reusing techniques that I'm used to on the web or on React Native, I want to use Flex, right? Or Flexbox. So I can use Vero Flex view, and basically I can lay out my, my content the same way I lay out them, uh, lay out it in React Native, lay out it on the web, and this is the Vero Flex component. Um, then I have image inside with, with the source. So this is where we get in our data. The source is from our data returned by subscriptions, and now we can render our image whenever we have a new marker, whenever we have updates, and everything is reflected automatically even in AR world. Um, so, in addition to having like static, uh, not static, in addition to have like 2D content, we also had this 3D model. That's where we, uh, th that's how we do it here. We ask if our uh, marker is of type 3D, then we render 3D, and you will see familiar things with uh, ambient lights, with image marker that you already seen, and the model component. So model component, that's where the actual model looks like, and you can imagine you will see the same that you've seen with the uh, 3D monster, because after all, it's the same components. It will be Vero 3D object. There, will be, there won't be quad, because there is no shadow, but the idea is pretty much the same. Well, not quite. With static uh, 3D model, we have our textures, right? We have everything on disk. Everything is loaded, uh, loaded in the bu bundle. This is fine, but how do I deal with something that is sitting on the server? I don't know what types of textures I get. Textures can be different. It can be physically based rendering. It can be regular rendering. I can have diffuse textures, I can have normal textures, I have like a bunch of them. So I also have, uh, can have MTL files, which stands for like material file. Uh, so what, what do I do here? So if you look at the model resources, and model resources is the one that is used for every model to load its resources, um, I have the resource URL and resource type. So here I have diffuse texture. So what I need to do, I need to get this resource type as a key and pass this URL as a texture. Then I will be able to load all my textures according to their actual names. Um, the problem is if I do make a mistake here with the resource type, yeah, uh, it won't load the specific texture. But the, um, you need to add like custom validations whenever you insert these markers, you probably will have some kind of admin for person to, to add this stuff. So you'll do validations there. Um, so what I do here, I have the resource type and I pass an URI with the resource URL. The same as you see here in the data. So now, 
what I, what I need to do, I need to create materials. And this is also different from what we've seen with the monster example, because I need to create them on the fly. I cannot say, okay, this is file, this is my animation, these are my materials, go. I need to create them on component did mount because um, I cannot do it ahead of time. I have this component only after my subscription is returned. So that's why I need to be like really, uh, like my textures need to be really uh, like compressed and um, so they won't cause this like lag, uh, loading lag because when it happens component did mount, specifically textures, it kind of freezes UI. So there are ways around it, but um, the main idea is to keep um, uh, textures as, uh, as low as possible. Um, and in addition to textures, we also need to define our animations. So why is that? We basically animate the scale of the model from being zero to like pop into the view. But we don't know what the model, model will get. We don't know what model is on the server. So we ca cannot say, uh, I could have said for monster, this will be uh, like two meters high uh, and like meter and a half in width, right? And this will be the scale. But somebody will um, load another model on the server with uh, like, uh, which will be like a tiny car that you've seen on the market. You, you cannot know what model will be there. So we need to pass this scale uh, property on, for our data field. And we will have it, I think here for models, yeah. Uh, so there is a type of the field that you can define, uh, JSON type, and then here is where I pass the actual scale, which is a really, really tiny scale. Um, Probably this tiny scale won't happen in the, the actual uh, world because um, the model that I downloaded was huge. It was like, I don't know like why you create 3D model of Lamborghini of like 10 meters on 10 meters. It's like, I don't know, like, but uh, that, that's why I need to kind of scale it down. That's why you had like, the, it took time to load. But when you create your app for the, the client or you have like your own uh, great startup idea and you need a bunch of assets, you'll probably have 3D model or you will buy a, a specific uh, like real-time optimized assets from TurboSquid or a bunch of other uh, 3D uh, uh, models like sharing uh, sites. Uh, and also you can see the lightning model here is PBR. That's why my component knows to render diffuse uh, metalness and roughness, which are uh, specific for PBR, instead of like specularity and normal map and stuff like that. Um, now, in addition to uh, like loading this, re so I created these materials, but what do I do now? I specify these materials and I need to load my MTL file. I cannot load it as material. I cannot create MTL texture. It won't work that way. Material is a file that specifies on which coordinates, uh, which textures, uh, uh, texture applies. So I need to load it uh, somehow. So there is a resource prop where I can uh, specify uh, either a bunch of texture or a bunch of, uh, or also MTL file. There will be uh, 3D models with really great MTL files, and the only thing that you will need to do, you will need just to specify the array of these textures, and that's it, the MTL file do like everything, it will just collect all of them and apply on the model. But in the case of this model, I had to specify materials uh, explicitly. So this is the material specification, and animations in the same way we did with the regular marker. So portals. You can imagine you will see the same repetitive thing. You, uh, we, we, have, we fetch our portals list, the same as we did with, uh, uh, with our markers. And uh, as you can see, there's a subscription here. And now with the portal, we have a bunch of specific components. So first of all, we have our airplane selector to select our surface. But in addition to surface, we have Vero portal. So Vero portal is a component that uh, expects two things. It, it expects 3D model for the portal. This will be your frame. And expects the 360 image. Now the good thing, and the reason I didn't do this for demo because I couldn't find free video like that, uh, like optimized to not to be lo loaded uh, for like ages. 
So uh, it supports both 360 images and 360 videos, which is kind of cool. You can create like sort of like Netflix portals or whatever, like you stand in front of portals, you choose what show you want to walk in and you see like 360 video of the show. Um, so if you do something with it, uh, let me know that you made tons of money from something that, uh, from the idea I, I, I gave you. <laughs> Uh, so the 3D object for the portal will be static in this case. And the reason is really simple. I need only one portal. Need only one, well, I might need lots of portal, but I will probably need only one frame. And as you can imagine, if I need like several portals with different models, I will do the exact same thing I did with, um, with uh, like um, 3D model of a uh, car that popped out uh, on, on the market. And uh, yeah, 360 image, as I, uh, as I told you. And here I, I pass the, the actual data from the server. So uh, this is how the code is, uh, re uh, how you write these AR apps. And as you can see, it's kind of a mixture of like, there are lots of concepts to process, right? There is like in addition to GraphQL to subscriptions, there is that thing like PBR and not PBR and diffuse map and normal maps and it, it just goes on. So one thing I, I need to like uh, extract, if you want to do AR apps, you need to understand 3D environment. You need to understand how like models work, how lights work, how shaders work. And um, at some point, um, and you need to basically uh, combine them with your knowledge of React ecosystem or React native ecosystem and um, not solely depend Right, only on Vero to create the whole experience, but depend on integration of both of them and all the technologies that you know and love. Uh, so the question is, so what types of apps we can actually create today, right? So um, there are quite a few actually. Uh, we can create location-based AR, which is a, a thing. And yeah, I have... Uh, I don't know, I have an underline because it's like not, I need to put the dash between, whatever. So um, location-based AR works in a really fascinating way. So I can get coordinates from GPS, and then there is an algorithm that I can run. These coordinates are processed in the real world coordinates. And uh, then I know the distance of meters from the point, and I know the vector of direction. Then I need to do a bunch of calculations to understand like what way it will be. Then I can basically point the user to this specific direction. It's it's like getting more and more precise in uh, like recent uh, year, I guess, something like that. And uh, at some point, it will, uh, will evolve to be more um, optimized and running more smoothly on the phones. Right now, it's like uh, lagging sometimes so, um, but you still can do something like um, airport navigation, museum navigation, stuff like that. Uh, people some uh, sometimes combine also with IoT stuff, so they put kind of IoT uh, beacons that give you a grid of um, like r uh, radio frequencies waves, so you can basically triangulate on both RFs and, and on GPS and AR, so you kind of work on three technologies at the same time to uh, make your location-based uh, um, AR more precise. Uh, games, games mostly created with Unity and Unreal, but you can do casual games with, uh, with Vero too. I actually wrote a blog post, in, uh, I think, a couple of months ago, uh, creating a um, like Tetris-like app with the with Vero React because it's like fairly simple, just following blocks and like getting score uh, stuff like that. Whenever you have like lots of like particle effects, lots of interactions, uh, you probably would go for the proper gaming engine because you built in a game. You can create retails of like IKEA, Wayfair. All of these companies already have uh, AR apps, and um, these apps are, are actually pretty huge. You can get an AR model of a sofa that you want to buy and you can put it in your living room and position your living room and look at how it will look like with the, uh, your apartment design or maybe change the color and basically it gives you uh, more engagement with the app. It gives the retailer more opportunity to send you ads. 
but um, eventually it uh, experience is m uh, way better than just like driving to the store or just looking on the fancy uh, picture how it looks like on the website. It will still be a 3D model which will still look fancy but at least you will know it, this is not uh, complementing your current uh, apartment design, something like that. Indoor navigation already told you. Tools, and, and this is actually something people don't think about, but one of the uh, most used, I think it's most used, I don't know the exact numbers, but uh, one of the uh, most used apps on AR apps is uh, just a ruler. It's AR ruler, you just like uh, measure your table or stuff like that. So it has a bunch of features, like you can measure your apartment, then you sort of like bring the walls up and have like 3D view on your apartment and your apartment plan, but it's more of a fancy stuff. Unless it's used by architects and then it's uh, not software architects, the, the <laughs> real estate ones. And um, though they probably don't rely on AR. But anyway, so uh, you can do this type of stuff for that. Uh, visual assistance, this is also a pretty huge. Um, having someone with a phone uh, with the camera open and someone connected to the, like, the same server and someone just like um, pointing or um, um, like putting a 3D model of uh, like uh, some, something for assistance to let's say um, uh, open a valve or um, fix uh, a sink or whatever. Um, you can totally do this also with Vero there are a bunch of existing apps for like HoloLens devices and stuff like that. But I mean, phone you have in your pocket, probably most of you don't have a 5K USD uh, headset at home for screwing in your sink, right? It's like not logical to do, but uh, phone is, uh, is used everywhere so you can um, try this type of app on, on the phone. Uh, for travel, it's also a pretty big one because you uh, can, for example, walk um, down the street. There's actually a cool example. So the, the, there was an app, I don't remember the actual name, but the, um, you walk down the street, you look at the CTA boards with like uh, the public transportation boards, right? And the marker that was used for the app was a generic one. So you don't have to use exact same image. You can use generic image and then it fills in the content according to your location to the actual timetables of the public transport. So think about that, you have like a table of this specific bus, you just scan it, you get the, time, the, the next bus will be in like this amount of minutes, hours, whatever. So uh, this is like one of the examples. Other example, you can go uh, along the streets, you can scan things, you get, can get descriptions of uh, like this museum or that gallery or this store. And um, this is also pretty, uh, pretty interesting. There is much more other implementations. And um, try and go and try and build stuff. And um, that's like the, the takeaways is this is, uh, this might look a little bit uh, complex with the like 3D modeling stuff. But when you start doing that, start doing that, it's, um, it, it's, you're getting the hang of it really, really fast. You like und uh, you understand concepts pretty fast. If you go to Vero React website, they have all, everything explained. They have like all the textures, or lighting explained. You don't uh, need to have degree in 3D modeling or like be a visual artist, or 3D model designer, whatever. You can just go to the website, just check a bunch of uh, uh, tutorials there, and you can start building your own stuff. And um, yeah, that's. That's my takeaways, so thanks a lot for, for having me. Uh, this is my website, this is my Twitter handle. The, all the code that you've seen is on this repo. I need to update it with hooks though. Uh, it's, it's without hooks right now. It will take a little bit because, yeah. Um, but uh, if you have any questions, if you just want to talk, you can reach uh, out on Twitter. These markers that I showed, I have tons of stickers uh, of the markers that I showed. So if you want to have this sticker, you probably also s uh, saw in, uh, in the hall, there are a bunch of these stickers. So you're welcome to grab them. I don't have enough space in the bag to bring, him, <laughs> bring them back with me. So 
Uh, also, if you want to have a t-shirt, I also have a bunch of t-shirts. So, yeah, thanks. <laughs>Hi, my name is Sarah, and this is Asian Conf in Dornbun. Amazing venue, Austria is beautiful. Meeting all of the people in the community and getting to go and hang out and ski.